This is my commercial break for insurance. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's a joke. Come on now. You think I would advertise? Sheesh. <laughs> Of course, there are some people that, because they don't know me, they, uh, <laughs> tend to overreact sometimes to some of the things that I post on the internet because they take offense over sometimes being called on the carpet, so to speak. I mean, I'm not trying to call them on the carpet. I'm just saying, look, here's, here's the other part of the issue. But they don't seem to like that, you know, and I don't mind that when somebody presents a case, you know, it's like, if you have an opinion, you could post it on my pages and web or whatever. You want to say something for a comment, great. But I'm wise enough to know that when I have an opinion, I tell people, this is my personal opinion. Or for me, this is what, how it applies. And in scriptural areas, that's wise because there are some things that aren't accepted by the church that people tend to get carried away on, like books of Barnabas or books of this or that and the other thing. And they want to go on the Internet and tell everyone, because this is accurate, they say, you know, and they basically, if you wanted to define it, they lie. Well, I don't call them liars. I don't go on their web page and say, oh, you're lying. No, I just make a comment that says, okay, fine, you know, you use this textus, but there's also the textus receptus, you know, we use this in order to, you know, understand what the scriptures say, and if you have an opinion, you know, sometimes your opinion could agree with scripture, and when it does, it doesn't matter how you got to that conclusion, the point is, you came to the right conclusion. Some people will come by way of the scripture, some people will come by reading some off-the-wall magazine, who knows, but... God, by His Holy Spirit, will bring you to the same conclusion. <laughs> mm -mm. Not really what people want to hear. Usually they want you to agree with them or else get off their page or go make a comment. Well, you know, that's, that's good, you know, and I get deleted a lot. But I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, you know, this is what the Bible says, you know, and this is what you say, and if you're in agreement, cool! I don't care how you got there. Or if you tell me, well, God said for me to put this out there the way I said it. I'm going, okay! If God told you to do that, go ahead. But you see, whenever there's this kind of like general idea out there on the internet that you can say anything you want to and nobody's going to comment on it, that's not true. Find somebody like me and I'm going to say, I don't think so. I mean, if you're telling me something weird, you know, it's like, well, you know, there's four gods. I don't think so. You know, or there's, God is it, Father, Son, and Spirit. And you could say that, but you know what the Bible says, and that's what I'll, way I'll present it. You know, I'll say, well, you know, you could say that, you can, you know, you're free to do anything you want to do and believe any way you want to believe. But the Bible says, you know, and this is what Jesus taught me, you know. Part of that process of knowing what to say and when to say it and how to say it and, you know, the choices we make every day about either being deleted from somebody's friends on Facebook or comments deleted wherever is part of discipleship and growing and becoming more of a believer. I know people have asked me, you know, like, well, you know, how did you get your knowledge base, you know, and my sister asks that, and she gets mad at my reply every time, you know. <laughs> you know, because as far as the basic tenements of faith, now I'm talking about tenements of faith. I mean, like what Jesus said. And if my sister's watching, you better stop the video now, because you're going to get mad. <laughs> when I got saved, I was so... Open, I guess, or so science fiction mind, whatever. Somehow, God just went whoosh, and He threw all this kind of knowledge in my head. Now, did I know it was in the Bible? I didn't know it was in the Bible. Did I know what it was? I didn't know what it was. You know, did I know how it applied? I didn't know how it applied. But as far as every single detail in the Old Testament, no, I didn't have every single detail in the Old Testament. But as far as the New Testament is concerned, yep, I 
God started quoting and spoken and telling and sharing and revealing and saying things, no way I could have known. Now, she doesn't like that because that's a gift of the word of knowledge, you know, and the word of wisdom, because I went from no knowledge and just walking up to, you know, a, you could call it an altar call, but a service, and having been whoosh, like way emotional experience that my eyes were open and my ears were here and I could see things that even to this day, you know, I can still see, but you know, we don't talk about it. But the point being is that it was a very, very spiritual experience that God wanted to do because he wanted to make me into who I am today. But the point being is that at that point in time, yes, I was given this phenomenal knowledge, you know, way beyond my ears. I was one of the foolish things of the world to confound the wise because I went right out, right after getting saved that night and started witnessing. <laughs> you know, now, if you grew up in the church, you'd say, well, of course you did. I didn't. If you had read your Bible before, um, you know, and had a Bible, an old one, you'd say, well, of course you did. I, I didn't have a Bible. Well, you, you know, if you got saved, you know, and they gave you all these, you know, like tracks and everything else to follow up on and to do, and you had, you know, one of those study Bibles that told you how to do it and what to do and where to go and what to say and how to be, then of course you did. Didn't have all this stuff. I was a Jesus freak. We didn't know any better. Now, to give honor where honor is due. Now, I went to it was Calvary Chapel, and they had follow up, sorta. You know, it was like a little, I think, a little thing that you filled out. You know, and you put your name, and you kind of ask you a few questions. Did you receive Jesus? You send it in. I think they might have sent you back Bible studies or not. I don't know. I didn't get one. <laughs> I got missed. But the way I got saved too in my salvation experience, as you have heard, you know, was a little bit different because when I went forward, they just took the few of us and took us in the back room and said, what's going on with that? But anyways, who knew? But when I'm asked that question about how did I learn, that was the basic tenements. Now, how did I learn about all this other stuff, you know, about theology and doctrine and dogma and yeah, eschatology and hermeneutic and homiletic and all these other, you know, great edicts, you know, and get my ethos and my moth my ethos and my, well, anyways. Well, I was kind of spoiled. You see, God was killing me. I'm, whoops, what, 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 huh, where? Well, he wasn't killing me, but I was dying of an incurable disease, and that's why I'm drinking this insure right now. It's kind of like, hmm. I got down to like, oh, I don't know, 89 pounds. And I could turn sideways and you couldn't see me. That's my old joke. Turn sideways, you can't see Michael. Guess what? <laughs> you could trace all my bones, you know. And I actually, you know, which brings me to another story. It's like, you know, I was laying in the VA hospital, you know, and I used to be one of those, I put up a little science of professional patient because the people from Cal State Long Beach would come over to my bed, the students, and they would practice on me because you could see all my bones, you could see all my veins, and you could literally, you know, ask me questions and I'd answer them. And, and uh, they could experiment, not experiment, they could practice on me because you could see everything. You could see my chest bones and all my chest. You could watch the beating of my heart. You could see all my, you know, my, my clavicles and everything was sticking out of my skin, you know. I kind of looked like those guys in Africa, you know, that were dying, you know, of starvation. I was. <laughs> And that was the way I normally looked. And yeah, they didn't think I was going to live. And I lived. So, you know, they would get me in, you know, and then they'd pump me up full of, you know, intralipids, and they'd stick veins, you know, stick me in the veins and in the heart, you know, and they'd flush blood in my heart, you know, and they'd put fluids in my veins and try not to blow the veins and give me intralipids, which is fat, you know, soluble fat. It's like a milky thing, you know, that they... You either look like milk going into your vein, you know. Oh, cool. Expensive, too. Come from Sweden. I mean, Switzerland at the time. So, anyways, they're trying to, you know, bring me back to life, you know, and meanwhile, I'm enjoying it. But because of that, you know, at different times, I grew up living on Insure, and now I just drink it because, actually, I kind of like it, you know. And man, I got insurance covering it, so it was like, hey, cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. And if I don't drink it, I, I get back down to 140 pounds, and I look... A little thin, but, you know, I don't usually go below 140 too often unless, you know, I start getting a little sick. But not from the disease anymore, just from the consequences of it. 
Now, if I drink insure once in a while and kind of eat my foods, you know, like, you know, McDonald's burgers and, you know, Burger King and Taco Bell and, you know, all the other fast foods that you guys can't eat. Kentucky Fried Pizza! Um, then I get up to, like, my weight that I should be around 170, 180, you know. Man, I've never been so fat all my life! I kind of like it. Because, see, I used to be 140 for 20 some odd years. <laughs> After I got, you know, kind of like less than dying, because it was like I was dying until I was about 30, you know, and then I lived past 30, and suddenly I was like 140 for, must have been 20 years. Then just the last couple of years, being married to my, my wife, I got fat. I'm up to 170, maybe 180. I got rolls. <laughs> Anyways, who cares about that? The point being is, God took this time of disease and absolute unk, you know, and junk that, you know, I really was barely surviving and barely alive, that uh, I was also going to Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa at the time. And I was very walking in the spirit, because really, when you're that time, man, you don't know if you're dead or alive, you know. <laughs> so you might as well be walking in the spirit, because your flesh is dead. It couldn't do anything if it wanted to. <laughs> uh, that's more true than you realize, and someday I'll tell you a story about that. But what I would do is that, when I was at Calvary Chapel at Costa Mesa, at that time, I went to Bible studies seven days a week. I'm one of the few, probably the only one that I know of, that actually could at that time, and I did it for a year, um, a little more than a year, go to a Bible study every night of the week. I mean, every day and night. Because I would go to, um, Monday was Chuck Missler, if I remember right. Tuesday was, I think, gosh, I can't remember who it was. Wednesday was like, um, School of the Bible sometimes, and then other times it was the Wednesday night Bible study, and then sometimes it was college and career. T. Thornton, and sometimes with some of the other different fellowships that were meeting. Sometimes went to Jewish Gentile Fellowship. Um, and then Thursday night was Thursday night Bible study, which was in-depth with Chuck Smith, you know. And then Thursday morning, I also went to that. That was uh, with Romaine, of course, you know. Oh, I can't miss that one. You know, so I'd go in the morning, I'd go at night, you know, on Thursday. So I'd get two in one day on that day. Wednesday's just one a day, you know, and Tuesday's one a day, and Monday was one a day. And then uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'd go to the Friday night concert, you know, and so that was, you know, concert, but you also got kind of evangelism message, you know. Kempner was running around, and, you know, different people were running around at that time, you know. Jimmy Kempner, I think it was. So, so anyways, Friday night, I get that. Then Saturday was like, there was a kind of college and career activities, but there was also some other things going on at church at times. I think sometimes there was college and career, if I remember right. And um, meeting there. And so I'd go into at least to one Bible study on Saturday, and then Sunday, oh, Sunday, I'd get three services in because I was working in the tape lending library. So working in the tape lending library, that means I got a chance to go over to the sound booth, and so I'd pick up the tapes, and I'd also help and distribute the tapes, you know, between the services. So I'd get three services in in the morning on Sunday. Then, yeah, I'd go to Sunday night service, you know, so I'd get two services in, and Sunday night in those days would last sometimes hours. Sometimes he'd go long, you know, and be like, once, I think, the longest was maybe a little over two hours, but I'm not sure. Could be wrong. So, for a year, think about that. I'm getting seven days a week Bible studies, and on top of that, Monday through Friday, or, well, maybe not every, well, yeah, I think I did every night of the week. Most of that year, every night of the week, night, after whatever was going on, I would work in the tape lending library when everything was shut down, duplicating tapes putting up tapes, taking the tapes out, putting them into mailing parcels and shipping them. Maddie and Eileen, you know, were in charge at the time. We didn't have a pastor or minister in charge. They were the ones that were doing it. And it was kind of a unique time that um, you know, they were very anointed in the ministry. And um, volunteers were very highly used in the tape lending library and around Calvary. So, you know, we didn't get paid. You know, I mean, Maddie and Eileen might have. I don't know. But um, I don't think they did. But I had the chance to obviously soak in a lot. And so when I was working at the Tape Lending Library, also, we would get in from all the Calvaries at the time, from all over the world, and it wasn't too far in the world, because there weren't that many in all over the world, but all over the world and all over the United States. Tapes, you know, and then we would 
duplicate them, you know, and to make sure that they were working, you know, we, you know, because you have a fast forward thing, but you also kind of, some of the times they would record in fast forward, so you had to listen to them sometimes to make sure that the master was working. So I got a chance to hear all kinds of tapes that wouldn't have heard otherwise. And then we also carried Firefighters for Christ tapes. Wow! So they would have all kinds of tapes from Melody Land. Anybody remember Melody Land? And all kinds of places that, you know, weren't from Calvary. So it was kind of neat, you know. I mean, I was getting dumped on huge amounts of Bible teachings and you name it, you know, in-depth, out-of-depth, this topic, that topic. I mean, just most people would be lucky if they grabbed one Nissler, you know, a year, you know. <laughs> I had Nissler every week. I was <laughs> like, oh, man. Oh, and then I forgot to tell you. Oh, yeah. And you know what else I did? We had KYMS, Christian Radio. <laughs> when I wasn't listening to all of that, or going to a Bible study, I'm listening to a Bible study. We had Walter Martin, we had Jay Vernon McGee, we had Chuck Smith. They were on at night. I'm listening to them. Oh, and worse than that, I lived with three Christian roommates. Oh, no. And they don't all go to Calvary. Two of them didn't. One of them did. Oh, no. And one of them worked. You know, he was Norman. Norman. Norm. He was a Sunday school teacher, you know, been in Calvary for years, you know, really neat guy. So we're living in Town Valley, you know, and I'm still, you know, like, getting all this, like, bombardment of just filled up, pulled up, and just blown out of the water stuff, you know. And then I also have Christian roommates. Man, I was spoiled, needless to say. So if you want to know how I got to where I am, I was... First of all, the Holy Spirit kind of dumped on me, you know, I'm like, you know, I got saved outrageously, and then 40, honestly, and it's kind of weird, but I know, I'm a weirdo, Jesus Gypsy, 40 days to the day, later, in a prayer meeting, I got baptized Holy Spirit, like, phenomenally also, and then that was really weird, you know, then after that, you know, because I'd already signed up for the Marine Corps, I was in the Marine Corps, and then I was out of the Marine Corps because I was dying from an incurable disease, and then I'm in the hospital bed dying, you know, and then... Man, God's taking me through all these experiences, you know, to make applicable, you know, the Word of God. Then, I get at least a year in at Calvary, you know, where I'm just like... It was almost like... You know what that is? That's a jackhammer that's jackhammering away in my brain because, you know what, God wanted it to be kind of like, you know, conforming to the image of the Son of God. So anyways, I'm getting all that jammed into me, you know, and I'm like... Walking around like zombie land. No, I was walking around like joy and peace. People used to want me to pray for them, you know, and people used to come up and ask me what was going to happen next or something else, you know. I mean, all kinds of strange things were going on in those days, and frankly, I still think that they happen and kind of goes on still the same way in a way, sort of, maybe not. Okay. But the point is, that's how I accumulated knowledge. I love the Lord so much that I didn't want to get infected by all these people around me. I wanted to be obsessed with God, and I was. And fortunately, I was so obsessed with the variety that Chuck Smith allowed all the pastors to be that I got a lot of good stuff inside. I think. Looks good to me. Ugh. Maybe some of it doesn't smell so good. But God wanted me to be who I am because I was very Jewish. And he was going to send me to different places throughout the world that if I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> boy, would I have been deceived. <laughs> Man, let me tell you. Whoa, can I tell you? Whoa, what I tell you? But no, I was meant to be developing into a personal relationship with God that I would prove and demonstrate that it wasn't about what we knew, but who we did and how we related to God, irregardless of the junk we got upstairs and irregardless of how much we think we applied in here and how much we think we throw out there is a long bomb from a football pass or whatever pitch we have, whether a screwball, you know, a slider, you know, or some kind of fastball that we're trying to get past the person, you know, so we can win the inning. Because in reality, it's not a game. I, in my life, was so messed up. I needed the living God to be living. I was so messed up. I needed the loving God to love me. I was so messed up. I wanted and needed love 
because what was about to happen would have killed me had not God loved me. Had not God been real. Had not God demonstrated emotionally and later physically and later intellectually, verbally, phys physically, emotionally, demonstratively, and had not God spoken directly to me, I would have died. I would have killed myself. As a matter of fact, I think I tried twice. It didn't work so well. Then, as if trying to kill yourself doesn't work, the doctor's trying to kill me. <laughs> Oops. I nearly died on the operating table. That's one time. And then, they gave me the wrong blood. Go figure that. That almost killed me. Oh well. But God said when he was loving me and talking to me and spending this wonderful time fellowshipping with me and developing me, he said I would not die but declare his glorious works and just speak forth those things which I had seen, heard, and understand and handled with my own hands. So I only shared those things that I experienced as well as what I had done. So God said, fine. You want to do it that way? Woo! So he moved me all over the place. He took me to places I never would have dreamed of. I went through experiences no one would ever try. Some of them were good. Some of them were bad. Some of them were bad and God made them good. And some of them were good and God kind of went, yeah. <laughs> oh well. But God took them all and said this. It's what I made you to be. Now I will pour my spirit into you and I will let you share me. And I went, yeah! Because <laughs> that's all I ever wanted to be. I didn't want to be a great pastor and all the men of God that I saw, that I served, that I worked behind the scenes for, as well as even handling their tapes and their ministry stuff when they were first getting started. Sometimes when they were still picking up cigarette butts, you know. When I saw all them go on to be great men of God, man, I thought, wow, did I do something wrong, Lord? When I saw all these women and men and the joy and the wonder of their perfect look like relationships, that it seems like they had the perfect marriage or the perfect child and they grew up and I thought they had the perfect love affair or the perfect song or the perfect ministry or the perfect church. And I went, wow, Lord. I do something wrong? When I found myself suddenly one day, ten years after all this happening, finally given health and didn't die at the age 30, I looked around and I thought, wow, why do people do what they do? Because I didn't understand in my mind how you could do what you do when you know what you know. And so I went out and proved Oops! that we are all sinners. <laughs> and I love it. No, but <laughs> oh no, well, who's, what's that kiss thing they go? And I love it. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> No, but, you know, the reality was, was that I was spoiled as a Christian to be taught the Word of God and get so much wealth of knowledge that God applied that in my life as I went through life, experiencing all that everyone's gone through, that we all have, for such as is common to man, all the things that we are tempted with. But God is faithful, who never suffers you to be tempted above that you're able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you're able to bear it. And if you don't, you fall down, and guess what? You get forgiven, and you get back up, and you keep going. So the reality of it all is that I have a perspective. I do believe that people should study the Word of God before they go out into ministry. I do think that people need to apply the Word of God in their life. I think that we see that in the Bible that Jesus took 12 men for three years and discipled them by way of experience because he was preparing them for ministry that after he died, when he rose again, when he had shattered their faith down to nothing, and they were at their worst, he appeared in the midst of them and said, Behold, just like I told you, I did it. It is accomplished. And so rising 
and sharing and seeing him, you would think they'd be ready. But they weren't. He said, now, I'm going to leave you again. I have caused you to rejoice and you see me and are alive and I understand and you've gone back out in the boats and fishing and now I've even made you some fish and you're eating, you know, and you're with me and we're just like the old days. But we can't go back to the old ways. It's not you and me. It's not me and the boys, you know, Jesus and the boys. We're not running around Galilee anymore. Now we got to get busy. Now we got to get on with what we're supposed to do. I died. I rose again. I'm sending you out to do what I wanted you to do. You had this time with me for a very specific purpose. You were my chosen. God gave you to me. And I have not lost any of you except the one. And now you go and wait in Jerusalem until you be filled with the Holy Spirit that God, my Father, is sending unto you. And I will go and I will send him and he will cause you to be my witnesses, even in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And he will cause you to remember everything that I've told you. Because you are going to go through everything I said you would do. You will suffer. You will be persecuted. You will die. And I will come again and take you home. So when they were ready after three and a half years of being with Jesus, or three years approximately, then God sent them out. I would say if you're getting saved for the first time, take, take a year or two. Take some time to get ready. Be into it for three years living with Jesus. Really, I mean dedicated to him. With all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all your strength. Don't be a Mormon missionary and go out for one year. Because that just gets them ready for life in some ways, and it prepares them to do their duty, they say. Don't just be a missionary for part-time, you know, by going out and practicing some little thing. For those three and a half years, the, more, the disciples went out on missionary outreaches. You know, he sent the 70 out, and they came back. You know, I mean, it wasn't like a permanent missionary thing. But take the time, whatever it may be, to learn who Jesus is. So you won't be deceived. And then, even if God has told you that you're going to be a pastor, you're going to be an elder, you're going to be a deacon, you're going to be a worship leader, take the time to live it. Live it in some way until God says, now go. But first receive the anointing and the filling that I'm giving you so that you can accomplish your purpose in life. The purpose-driven life is not a wrong book to read. It is perfectly accurate in everything it says. There isn't a scripture inaccurate in it. The purpose of God is to cause you to know Him in a very meaningful and real way. And it is very obvious that that is what the book says to do. But then it also says one thing that you don't get from normally reading the scriptures. God has a purpose for you to do as you are living with Him every day. And that is to walk in His way and accomplish His will. And the way you do that is every day. Once a day, some way, talk to, walk with, listen and hear, and then go and obey what God says, what God may say. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation. For if you do these things, then you are blessed indeed, and you are called no longer my disciples, but you are called my friends. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. I pray not for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you love also one another. 
He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify it, that he might cleanse it, that he might purify it with the washing of water by his word. The deep things of God Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. It is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth it is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be straightened with the might by his Spirit in the inner man, that you be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Jesus, which passes knowledge, that you be filled with the fullness of God. If you want to know all about God and experience Him, it's summed up in one word, three. God is love. When you love, you know God. He that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that knoweth God, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. I was desperate. I was broken. I was absolutely in need. My family called me an only child in a family of four. My mother, I do not remember hugging me ever. The only hug I remembered in my life before I got saved was this. On the night that I was fearful that my mother was in trouble, I woke up. For I had heard my stepfather and my mother fighting. And I always kept a knife under my bed for fear that she might need my help. So I loved my mother so much. I cared about my mother so desperately. I worried about my mother that on this night, I walked out the front door and the car came up, and two people got out. And my mother walked over, and my face was full of relief and joy. And my mother pulled back her fist and hit me in the mouth and dropped me in my, dropped me right there. And she passed by me and went inside. And her girlfriend wrapped her arms around me and held me, for I was broken man, child, 17, 16, broken beyond measure, weeping, crying, snot pouring down my face, shaking uncontrollably. Some people would say, I suffered a, what do they call those? Emotional breakdown or whatever they call it, nervous, nervous breakdown. Oh, I was an emotional person anyways, I could cry, you know, I know how to cry. At that moment, it may have been a, a nervous breakdown. The love I had projected out there was met by a fist in the face. And no, I was not prepared or ever accosted by my mother in that way. My love that I thought I had for my mother my love that I thought I had for my sisters was always demonstrated in little things that they never accepted or understood. But God saw. God knew. God saved me. Because at a concert, when I went to it and I saw the love of everyone there, and if you've been to a Jesus people concert in those days, you knew the love. It wasn't about the joy. It wasn't about the spirit. It was about the love. You knew 
the love. They glowed. And when I got saved, the love filled me and overflowed and I glowed. And I finally found the love I was looking for. Because I was so desperate. I was so in need. I wanted to be loved. I wasn't looking for love in all the wrong places. I didn't know where to look. I had no idea. I thought my mother loved me. And that was love. I thought my sisters loved me. And I thought that was love. I thought all the stepdads loved me. And I thought that was love. I thought the people in school who tried to cut my hair because it was long, the people who beat me up on the way to school because they were my best friends, I thought that was love. Was I a broken child? Not in my book. I thought that was normal. Today, people would be using that as an excuse. <laughs> now me, I thought, shoot, I was like <laughs> pretty darn tough, you know, I thought. But God knew my heart. He knew what I could do. He knew what I could be. He knew I could love. Like no other ones would love. Like passion beyond measure. Like joy unspeakable. Like peace divine. To fill my heart and soul and being and reach out to the hand up there, like Neil Diamond said, and to reach my hand out to someone else and to bring them along the way. And to say, God, Yes! Wow! Cool! Let's do it, Lord! Let's save the world! You and me! We don't need anybody else! <laughs> so you see, God is the answer. If you're one that wants to go out in ministry, <laughs> it may kill you. <laughs> At least it'll come close. Because at some point in time, the only thing that will keep you alive is the only thing you ever wanted in life anyways. And that is, and always shall be, a personal, a real, a dynamic, an overflowing relationship with God that everyone around you will be affected by even you keeping silent. You can't help but cause either frustration or salvation to come about in those all around you. You have no clue that you are affecting everyone in the room you walk into. So be thou faithful as a faithful friend to Jesus, as he said, because he no longer wants to call you a disciple. He no longer wants to call you a follower <laughs> unless you just want to follow. But he wants to call you because you know him, because you've heard him, because you've walked with him, because you've talked with him, because you spent the time to get to know him all those years. He doesn't just want to pray for you. He wants to call you friend. Will you be his friend?